wonderful. David, do you want to come out too? Sure. Hello. Are we meant to speak during the music? <laughs> I'm wearing disco tights, which is possibly why that's happening. Uh, wonderful. So we're going to chat about radical love. For anyone that was at our Love Confessions workshop yesterday, this will be partially a continuation of that theme. Uh, but I want to introduce you to an old college professor of mine. David taught when I was at Brown, and he taught an incredible course called Discontents with Modernity, which was perfect if you were 18 or 19 and feeling very discontented with the world. And part of the reason I invited you here was because you're, you're really an alien amongst this scene. Um, not actually an alien. You're uh, referring to the gray hair, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think you can bring a, a really welcome philosophical perspective and perhaps historical perspective to what we're all doing here. And I'd love, before we jump into radical love, for you to just share a few observations so far and what this experience has been like for you and any themes or sort of anthropological analysis you could share of, of the t types of people you see here? So first let me say, um, first let me say hello. <laughs> what? <laughs> hello, we share. All right. Um, you know, I actually want to begin with a note of thanks. Uh, I often find that conversations like this, uh, that if you don't begin with a note of thanks, that that gratitude doesn't permeate through. So I'm extremely grateful to Alexa. I mean, she, you know, we met when you were four, maybe 18, right, 18 years old. Um, and you know, the, I mean, I, I, the other reason I want to begin with a, a word of thanks is that that note of thanks, that note of gratitude, is something that I find have found here at We Share in a kind of understated way, right? Um, you know, I don't, I didn't know much about the share economy other than as a participant in it prior to coming to WeShare. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm impressed by the energy here. I'm impressed by the, um, the desires. What do you think about the optimism? Ah. You've encountered a lot of optimism, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I think there is a lot of optimism here. Um, but it's something that I might distinguish between optimism and hope, you know? I mean, I think one of the things that I'm finding at WeShare is that as much as there is a resistance to corporate capitalism, as much as there is a resistance to profit as a primary motivation, you know, I'm seeing permeated through my, the conversations and, and the presentations and even the, in the kind of, you know, the aesthetic of this. We're in a, a cabaret with a corporate wall, right? Um, and you know, how, you know, how does one find balance in there? There's optimism perhaps to be successful, but is that grounded in a kind of humanizing hope? And I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I'm very curious you know, about people's humanity here. I mean, how do you find it as, as, a, as a, oh, does everyone know, everyone knows, right, that Alexa's book is coming out next month? Does everyone know this? Does everyone have a copy of their receipt of Misfit Economy? <laughs> Yeah? It's a wonderful book, really. It's a, it's a wonderful <laughs> book. Um, yeah, the book comes out next month, June 23rd, but you can pre-order a copy of it now, and it's about hackers and gangsters and really the fringe side of innovation. So what can we learn about the people who are immensely creative and innovative but aren't here in the room today but are perhaps entrepreneurs who are in the drug economy? Yeah or you know, are hackers who are working on important elements of privacy. So lots of stories of innovation from the fringes, basically. Yeah, and so maybe we could, we could pick up on that note of the fringes, mm -hmm. right? I mean, because one of the curiosities I've, I have about WeShare are the folks who are not here, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the folks that are talked about here are often communities, are often um, consumers, but I'm wondering about the marginalized. Right, not just the misfits, right? The um, you know the great uh, German philosopher Theodor Adorno often referred to the remainders of the remainders, right? The truly marginalized. I mean, you know, sort of what capacity does the share economy have? What capacity do those who have invested so much energy? I mean, the folks in your generation, right? Not the silverback generation, but your generation, you know, that that wants to do good in the world. But what kind of good do you think they're rendering? 
Well, what lessons or insights would you draw from previous social movements around that inclusivity piece? If this movement is to be one that's going to be democratized, if next year we see this community as one that becomes more diversified, what does that invitation look like? Well, I mean, if I think about you know, the, the touchstone social movement I always think about in the United States is the civil rights movement. Right, so here, if we we're going to talk about radical love, you know, if you think about Martin Luther King, if you what think is about, radical love? Can what you is just define? Because I think there are a lot of people that think that's an open relationship or some sort of polyamorous situation, which it could be. Yeah, it could um, be. But what what does that mean to you? Uh, I think radical love is an intense version of love. You know, I think one of the things that we find in the share economy is a kind of um, an, an almost kind of banal version of love. You know, the liking of something, right? Or you say, I, you know, I adore somebody. Radical love is disruptive. Radical love is deeply human, right? It demands full presence. Um, it takes expression in things like compassion. And it's beyond just romantic love. It's beyond, I mean, it may include romantic love, but I wouldn't prioritize romantic love. I think it, radical love is often um, deeply moral. It's deeply ethical, and it can be deeply political, right? So you asked me about social movements. You know, if I think about, you know, Martin Luther King, you know, the civil rights movement was driven by an ethos of love. You know, King referred to love as a weapon, right, that would take apart and destroy white supremacy. He talked about a weapon that would um, denaturalize white supremacy. You know, I was, think, I was trying to think of like, what are the analogies, what are the metaphors of this generation and the share economy in regard to thinking about the intensity of radical love? And I had to avoid thinking of this idea of like, you know, love as a killer app, right? And I think that would be awful, right? I mean, if anything, like, love should be disruptive and grounding. It should be unsettling and humanizing. Um, you know, we talked yesterday in the in the boat, is it a boat or a ship? It's a boat, yeah. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, we, talk, we talked about the, the difficulties people have in realizing their full humanity with each other, you know, realizing desires. I mean, you know, much of the share economy is driven by certain kinds of desires, in so far as I see it, right? Desire for alternative ways of being with each other, alternative ways of being in the world. Um, but I'm, I have this question, you know, about the share economy, you know, whether it is really affording spaces, affording time, where, you know, I, I could feel like my full presence could show up, right? I mean, radical love is often this insistence that your full presence will be there. My full presence will be there if you are suffering. Or we're talking about the marginalized, we're talking about the remainders of the remainders. Right. Yeah, so you're talking about a greater embodiment, a greater willingness to bring your humanity into situations. And I think uh, this came up yesterday around the philosophy track. We were exploring this idea of self-interest. Mm -hmm. And we have these little containers that have been left over from a residual form of command and control capitalism. Mm -hmm. And now we're trying to fill those containers with different types of scripts and formulas for how to be in the economy. And those are around sharing and around empathy and around collaboration. But those are also equally reductive scripts. Yep. Because I don't want to, I want to be a messy human, right? Yeah. I don't want to just come in and be collaborative all the time. Sometimes I want to be selfish, or sometimes I want to be a hermit and go and do something. Or, you know, sometimes empathy is a challenge. Yeah. So, what are the, for those that are sort of reco recovering, and yesterday we heard a lot of folks that were dealing with a more anemic type of love. You know, a love that was just sort of marginalized to the element of romantic relationship. What are, wh how does that humanization begin to happen? Well, I mean, I think, <clears throat> sorry, the humanization begins to happen where you don't think the end of relationships is in the economy, right? That the, the economy shouldn't be, <coughs> excuse me, shouldn't be where our desires are completed, right? And, I, and I, I, you know, one concern I have about the share economy is that it, almost fetishizes economic relationships as the ultimate relationships, right? Or online relationships as the ultimate relationships. I mean, if the share economy is gonna break things open, it's gonna open up our access to people 
that we might not otherwise have. I mean, if we think about, well, what keeps us from love? I mean, there are these gaps, these mediations, you know, that if I can only connect to you through Facebook, if I can only connect to you through the internet, if I can only connect to you through my device, how connected are we really? So one of your challenges then to the sharing economy, if I'm hearing, it, is really about disintermediation mm -hmm. and going back to the basics of community in a sense. The basics of community, but also the basics of actual contact, right? You know, so that, uh, you know, that what is it to actually s insist that when I greet you, are you shaking my hand? I'm shaking okay. your hand. Right? I greet we're you. In France, so we're, we're in France. We're in, oh, okay. sorry. <laughs> right? But even that, I noticed this with the French where, you know, there are no lips, right? It's like a kiss like this, a kiss like this. <laughs> you know, this is, this is a presentation of affection, but it's a little, you know, it's, it's like hedging your bets, like, mm -hmm. right? You know, so what, you know, what is it to actually present my whole self to you and to receive it? You know, the, I think the problem of the mediation in the share economy is that it's saying, well, it's through a form of capital. It's through, so my relationships to you are transactional, right? They're not reciprocal. I think one of the demands of radical love is to say that there's an ethic, there's a morality, there's a politics that should be reciprocal. Not insofar as like, you, you know, you give me a handshake and I'm going to give you a handshake back, right? And it's more than just gifting, right? It's the capacity to receive. So the humanity that you're trying to restore, I think you could have a lot of annoying behavioral economists and others say, actually, that's always been about um, transactions in some way. Mm -hmm. That the handshakes that we've given or the gifts that we've given at some point have al always been motivated by self-interest or self-interest because cooperation allows for evolution. Mm -hmm. So what, what would be your counterpoint to those types of critics? Well. That the, trans that the relationship doesn't, doesn't have to see seek material ends, right? Yeah. I mean, the, so you know, the, often the, the transactional is around certain kind of materiality, right? So our relationship is only fortified, is only legitimated because, oh, look, we produced a digital platform, right? Oh, oh we looked, we produced this thing, as opposed to... Or the even the other day someone asked me, oh, how do you know that person? And I said, well, I knew them as a brand before I knew them as a person. <laughs> They had a sort of internet persona. Yeah, and well, and, and you know, like I'm not gonna, all of us have some persona or another, right? You're Amish um, futurist, right? Um, you know, there's, a, there's this exercise I did with a group of students this year where I asked them, you know, how are you seen in public versus how do you want to be seen in public, right? And you know, I think that, that, that Opening spaces where people can actually be seen and experienced as they want to be, as opposed to as they ought to be, sh could be the ways in which love disrupts some of this. Mm -hmm. right? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I was thinking as, you know, the, f the fact of market ends being a sort of uh, instrumentalization of a lot of relationships. And, you know, historically, we're taught that society kind of happens in a big circle, and then there's a little circle, which is the market, right. and the market is embedded in that circle. And what we've seemed to inherited now in life is that there's actually a big circle, which is the market, mm -hmm. and society is that smaller circle embedded in the market. And so everything, even your instincts towards polyamory, could just be a symptom of a sort of consumeristic orientation. Right. And maybe increasingly for, for certain singularitists or technology theorists, the market is even a smaller circle within a circle that is technology. Mm. And so that just seems, you know, in a sort of Marxist inevitability, sort of deterministic way, something that could continue. It could continue. And, I, you, know, you know, one of the questions I have about the language uh, or the embrace of the language of innovation, right, is innovation to what end, right? So is it innovation to reinforce those circles that you're talking about? Or how might we think about innovation in truly social and truly public ways? Right, so I mean, you know, one of the things I haven't really quite heard at We Share Fest is a politics. You know, where it's a politics not just about social goods, but it's a politics about advancing a true public good. Right, so like, what publics are the share economy serving? And what would that look like? Like, would that mean Diana runs for president in France, or what does it mean to engage politically? 
Well, our politics isn't about formal, doesn't necessarily have to be about formal politics, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be about party politics. Politics is one way to characterize relationships. It's about power, right? It's about empowering people. Um, you know, I, I worry a bit about if, if people's political energies are sublimated, are infused only in the economic, it delimits what are possibilities. And so that, you know, if we can only think in those terms, and there's, there's also an access question, yeah. right? I mean, I've been, what's this phrase? The low barrier. To entry? Or yeah, the low barrier yeah. of entry, right? Mm -hmm. I've been hearing a lot of this, but sorry. <laughs> I, know, and I know it's not like this, but this is what I keep thinking, right? There's this low barrier of entry, right? Um, which I think is actually quite high, right? It's a low barrier of entry perhaps for consumers, but I'm not sure it's a low barrier of entry for ordinary people to become makers and producers in the shared economy. Am I wrong about that? Well, I think the question is how do you deprogram the consumer identity to become more of a citizen type of identity without losing all the humanity and mess? Like, it, the worst thing would be is if you then had a concept or a definition of a new citizen mm -hmm. that was equally limiting to the idea of the consumer. Just, you know, this, even the maker, the fetishization of the maker is problematic because not everyone should be a producer and specialization makes economic sense. And, and there's a tension, right? And there's a tension between, well, uh, as someone was speaking yesterday about citizen economies, right? And citizen economies is still beholden to the metaphor of the nation, right? And, and much of what we're hearing in the share economies is to try to break away from the framework of nations and national markets and national cultures. I don't want to reduce anyone's humanity, nor do I want to reduce anyone's love, you know, to mere national boundaries. The kind of politics I'm invested in, when we talk about radical love, the corollary to radical love to me is radical democracy, you know, where everyone, everyday, ordinary people can be involved in making a world. But hasn't democratic participation always been a bit of an illusion? It has been insofar as it's been domesticated to electoral politics, right? So that, you know, that, what was it, what are we calling it? Barrier to entry. Sorry, the low barrier of entry, right? Yeah. You know, of voting. You know, I mean, I think one of the things that the share economy could contribute to uh, different kind of politics is in regard to representation. You know, so like, how am I, how are my deepest desires truly represented, like truly represented in the public? How am my, how are our, our desires, right? And so, you know, we, we've talked a bit, I've heard a lot of community talk, right, around the shared, community, shared economy. And I have to admit, like, I'm not quite clear on who the community is, right? I mean, I, I you know, one different f frame of reference I might use is about solidarity rather than community. You know, so what would the shared economy look like if it was more about solidarity? Where solidarity can be temporary, right? We meet each other, we have some mutual interests, we have some mutual passions, and those mutual passions may lead to certain kinds of projects, but it doesn't mean we're in a community as such, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, it's the challenge of, you know, Occupy, for example, I think had a lot of solidarity principles in it. You had groups of people with very different, at times, ideological perspectives mm. or very different yeah, perspectives on issues, some being more reformist, some being more radical, and yet they were all able to sit under a common umbrella. Yeah. And so maybe part of the, the thing you're exploring is what does that look like to open source we share around solidarity principles? Absolutely. You know, uh, the, the great essayist, Rebecca Solnit, uh, she wrote this amazing um, a treatment of the Occupy movement. And the title was this quote she had heard from one of the activists said, compassion is our currency. Right? If you think about that, that's a profound <laughs> revolutionary claim, right? It's like, we're not exchanging money. We're not exchanging money. But it money. sounds kind of cheesy and like a bad Hallmark card also. Yeah, yeah. okay, so on that, on, yeah. that, on that point, I mean, I think one of the things that one has to fight for in regard to love in is public... Is combating cynicism. Is, is, yeah. Right, is combating cynicism, yeah. right? So you, if I, when I talk about love in different contexts, inevitably, there's some crank in the back of the room. It's like, why are you talking about love? Like, love, you know, it's, just, it's a sneery thing. We t again, it, it's like it's, people think it's banal. And yet, who in this room, who in WeShareFest 
does not seek genuine, deep, authentic love. Not affirmation, right? Not affirmation, but love that's not contingent, that's not conditional, you know, that is abundant, even excessive, yeah. right? We all want some version of that, don't we? So She does. <laughs> Thank you. The Appreciate pillow that. people do. The pillow people do. What about, so this concept of agency, because one of the themes that I'm hearing you say is basically we want, we, we should spark greater, our desires that we have internally, um, our biggest hopes and dreams should be able to be manifested in society, unless potentially they're perverse dreams or, you know, have negative repercussions for other people. And so that's ultimately a question about agency. And I think it's interesting because so many people in this room are entrepreneurs. And the formula for entrepreneurial agency is that you achieve that agency through your venture, through your project. Um, and that project allows you, it o I mean, it almost gives you this sort of controlling complex, right? It allows you to feel like you have power in the world and you have scale and you have market. And then that's an, a certain expression or perhaps perversion of ag agency. Yeah. Well, and that's a desire for a certain kind of presence in the world you might not otherwise have, right? So if we think of ourselves as agents, what we also want is a sense of identity that has not permanence, but a certain kind of reality, a kind of tactility, a kind of authenticity, right? And so if, I'm a, if I want to change the world, yep. and Which I'm- Which you do. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, and fight against the cynic in me, yeah. And I don't want to inhabit this identity of the entrepreneur. Yep. What are my other alternatives? Well, I mean, your other alternatives may just to be to figure out what kind of human being you are. I mean, I, I think you know the, the 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 language of the entrepreneur is very seductive, right? And the share economy, like, it's very seductive. Why? Because you say like, oh, I don't have to be constricted to corporate life. I don't have to be constricted to the demands of capitalism and. I'm going to create my own path, right? I'm going to create my own path. And where there's a convergence between the kind of humanist love, radical love that I want to talk about or think about and help us think about, um, and that sentiment is to think, well, how do I forge my sense of place in the world rather than find it, right? Capitalism says, well, we, you're, we will give you whatever sense of you know, who you are but to forge it, to be an active participant in your own making, right? Um, and so, but again, like... And the barriers to that, right? Um, so there's a great, well, not those types okay. of barriers, different types of barriers. Yeah. Um, but there's a great Banksy quote mm -hmm. that says, um, sorry, but the lifestyle you ordered is currently out of stock. Um, and there's a lot of authenticity talk these days. But what are some of the challenges? You work with students a ton who are sort of contemplating these things. There's a kind of silencing going on as well. Um, and I think what, when I first encountered entrepreneurship, I did find it really powerful because uh, there was the authenticity of a sort of first wave of social entrepreneurs, basically, who got out of the system and were able to sort of, even in the power and the courage that they had to do that exploration, I could sort of take that into my own life and I could feel like there were other people out there like me. And I would say in some regards, so many people here have this type of misfit identity where they're not fitting formally into any one of these types of paths. Well, I mean, I think, you know, the, the I mean, the language about authenticity, I think is driven actually by the, an anxiety about authenticity, Yeah. right? So we are deeply anxious, like, you know, is my true self going to find, again, expression in the world. Am I, as a, you know, I'm a college professor, I'm dealing with these young folks from 17 and a half to 22 years old, you know, where they're literally changing in front of me. And you can feel the anxiety because, you know, if they leave college, they, they have $150,000 in debt. You know, that, that tightness, that kind of stress around, well, I can't be creative, I can't be imaginative. Right, the entrepreneurial metaphor. You say, well, forget the system. You know, you can make your own way. But it's actually, and this goes back to your messiness point. 
Well, what about the romantic identity? Like this pre, one of, so I explore alter egos a lot and we're gonna do an exercise a little bit later around some of this too. But one of the identities that I've been really preoccupied lately was this romantic identity. This sort of desire for transcending out of the current society. Well, and the romantics, you know, had a very robust sense of self. You know, one of the things I'm actually very impressed by, we share, right, in the share economy, is that there's ample evidence of very robust senses of self. Right? Why is that impressive? Doesn't that make well, you worried? It's impress well, it's impressive insofar as, you know, we're theoretically still in a recession. Right? We're still in this kind of, this culture of scarcity. Here, you have evidence of an abundance of imagination. I mean, one of the things I would hope that you all do is to unleash yourselves even more. You know, not try to constrain yourselves to prof a vision of success that is just about profit or about, what's the other even word? Even about purpose. Or about scala mm -hmm. scalability, scalability, yeah. right? But it's about purpose, right? And that, you know. But I think even the purpose could pose a limitation. You know, now you have books called The Purpose Economy, and for example, and that provides a whole nother sort of treadmill type of relationship. Well, and, it's, and again, like, it's the instrumentalization of certain kinds of values. Right. Right? Again, if the share economy could be much more self reflective about the values that drive you, right? And how do you prevent those from being co-opted and becoming a sort of commodified lifestyle? Sometimes you got to break out. Mm -hmm. I mean, the share economy is going to become its own ideology, right? The share economy culture is its own ideology, and sometimes you have to break rank. And there are different metaphors, too, for how you can think about your relationship or orientation with the system. Mm -hmm. So we talk about change from within, which is being this sort of institutional rebel within the system. There's this kind of alternative stance you can occupy where you've broken off or you've had this like bo bohemian epiphany and you try and create something radically alternative and new. But you can also have this kind of peninsula type of orientation, which you're connected to the mainland economy, you know when to go in and when to camouflage, but you're also isolated enough that you can protect yourself. Well, and I guess, you know, if we're talking about land masses, I mean, yeah. <laughs> maybe to end with this point, about insisting on one's integrity and insisting on the integrity of others. I mean, I think if we're gonna go back to this theme of radical love, right? If you take out the, you know, the, the language of, of the authentic, but how do we help each other insist on our integrity as a form of love, right? And if I see you that you're not able to do that, how might I jump into the breach and help you to do as well? Great. Misfit Economy, June <laughs> 23rd, Alexa Clay. Radical love forthcoming All right. by you. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank you.